long chapter, very exciting. Um, I'm going to finish, um, well, no, I'm going to start with the end of chapter one of Joshua, and you'll see why as the sermon progresses. Only be strong and courageous. Then Joshua, son of Nun, secretly sent two spies from Shittim. Go, look over the land, he said, especially Jericho. So they went and entered the house of a prostitute named Rahab and stayed there. The king of Jericho was told, Look, some of the Israelites have come here tonight to spy out the land. So the king of Jericho sent this message to Rahab. Bring out the men who came to you and entered your house, because they have come to spy out the whole land. But the woman had taken the two men and hidden them. She said, Yes, the men came to me, but I did not know where they had come from. At dusk, when it was time to close the city gates, they left. I don't know which way they went. Go after them quick. You may catch up with them. But she had taken them up into the roof and hidden them under the stalks of flax she had laid out on the roof. So the men set out in pursuit of the spies on the road that leads to the fords of the Jordan. And as soon as the pursuers had gone out, the gate was shut. Before the spies lay down for the night, she went up on the roof and said to them, I know that the Lord has given you this land, and that a great fear of you has fallen on us, so that all who live in this country are melting in fear because of you. We have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did to Sion and Og, the two kings of the Amorites east of the Jordan, whom you completely destroyed. When we heard of it, our hearts melted in fear, and everyone's courage failed because of you. For the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on the earth below. Now then, please swear to me by the Lord that you will show kindness to my family, because I have shown kindness to you. Give me a sure sign that you will spare the lives of my father and mother, my brothers and sisters, and all who belong to them, and that you will save us from death. Our lives for your lives, the men assured her. If you don't tell what we are doing, we will treat you kindly and faithfully when the Lord gives us the land. So, she let them down by a rope through the window, for the house she lived in was part of the city wall. She said to them, Go to the hills so the pursuers will not find you. Hide yourselves there three days until they return, and then go on your way. Now the men had said to her, This oath you made us swear will not be binding on us, unless when we enter the land, you have tied this scarlet cord in the window through which you let us down. And unless you have brought your father and mother, your brothers and all your family into your house. If any of them go outside your house into the street, their blood will be on their own heads. We will not be responsible. As for those who are in the house with you, their blood will be on our head if a hand <coughs> is laid on them. But if you tell what we are doing, we will be released from the oath you made us swear. Agreed, she replied. Let it be as you say. So she sent them away and they departed. And she tied the scarlet cord in the window. When they left, they went into the hills and stayed there three days until the pursuers had searched all along the road and returned without finding them. Then the two men started back. They went down out of the hills, forded the river, and came to Joshua, son of Nun, and told him everything that had happened to them. They said to Joshua, The Lord has surely given the whole land into our hands. All the people are melting in fear because of us. Right, I'm going to stop there. I'll just pray briefly. Father, I just pray that today you will reveal 
truths from this chapter to us today, and Lord, we will hear clearly what you have to say for, to us. Amen. Amen. Right, I've entitled this sermon, How to Be a Good Prostitute, right. hoping to have a full crowd <laughs> of people. And uh, I'll come back to that more later on. This is an absolutely fascinating story. It's a really exciting story. It's got it's, it's all in there. The spies, there's hiding the spies, the double agents, there's a whole Cinderella to Richard's story, Rex to Richard's story. Um, and now the context is Joshua 2 comes right after Joshua 1. I know. I know, I had to work hard on that one. Um, and what we find, Joshua has taken over leading the Israelites into the Promised Land. He's taken over from Moses. Moses. Moses died right at the end of the last chapter of the book before. And now we're into the story of Joshua. And we'll be looking a little bit at Joshua 1 to get a little bit of the context. Joshua has been given the mission directly from God to lead the Israelites into the Promised Land to cross the Jordan and to take Jericho. And I'm sure lots of you will know the story of the fall of Jericho, how they marched around the city and they marched around finally seven times and blasted their trumpets and the walls came tumbling down. And you can probably sing the song to me as well, <laughs> but we'll leave that for later. So we know that Rahab is a Canaanite. Canaanites did not worship the true God. They worshiped all sorts of other gods. They were pagans. She is a resident of Jericho, and Jericho is a fortified city in Canaan. Now, on to Joshua. His first job on taking over from Moses was to lead the Israelites into the Promised Land. What a commission. What a job for your very first job that you had to do. How on earth was Joshua going to fill Moses' shoes? Well, if we glance briefly at Joshua 1, we'll find out. We know he'd been there the whole time, watching what Moses did, learning about Moses' relationship with God. Even the time when Moses disobeyed God, which he did once due to a lack of faith. He had been given the commission from God himself, and it says in Joshua 1, verse 2, Get ready to cross the Jordan River, into the land I am about to give the Israelites. Okay, so that's his own commission directly from God. We also know a little bit about Joshua, right in verse 1 of chapter 1. It says, Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' aid. So he's like the right-hand man to Moses. He's been there the whole time. And also, there's a little refrain in, in chapter 1, which um, sticks out to me. It says, be strong and very courageous. Three times God says this to Joshua, three times. And then right at the end of the chapter, when the Israelites say they have trust in Joshua, and they're going to trust him just like they trusted Moses, they say back to him, whoever rebels against your word and does not obey it, whatever you may command them will be put to death. Only be strong and courageous. So it's like a rallying call. It's come from God, and then the people are reflecting it back to Joshua, showing their trust in him. Now, Joshua has decided to send two spies into Jericho uh, with a secret plan to find out about the fortifications, quite likely, to find out, possibly more importantly, how the people felt about... Um, the Israelites and the army that is camped right outside the city, although it is across the Jordan River, so obviously it's a little way away because there's the Jordan River, which is quite a big river. They're also learning how to get in and out secretly, and then they're going to report back to Joshua and all the Israelites. Now, this is a clever plan, and Joshua has learned this plan from Moses because Moses sent 12 spies in, 40 years earlier. And two of those spies were Joshua and Caleb. Joshua and Caleb were the ones that went back to Moses and said, God has given us this land. But unfortunately, the other 10 spies gave a different story. 
and said the people are giants and we can't possibly go in and we're all frightened. So because of fear, the Israelites spent another 40 years wandering about in the wilderness. But Joshua knows God's promise is to give the Israelites a city, however well fortified it is. And it says that Joshua was 40 when he was a spy. So he's pretty old now. And it does say in Numbers 26, verse 65, which you all know, John, probably. No one shall enter the promised land except for Joshua and Caleb. Because they were the people that had faith originally that God was going to give them the land. Everybody else that was alive at the time of the original looking at the promised land, everybody else has died in the wilderness. And only Joshua and Caleb are the only ones who are still alive. Anyway, enough of Joshua, we're looking at Rahab, aren't we? Who is Rahab? We want to know her backstory. How come is she? She is a prostitute. Now we know clearly, and as we see it reflected over and over again, she is part of God's plan to overcome Jericho. But she is a woman, and we know women are second-class citizens. And she's in the most despised profession possible. It's not anybody's career choice to be a prostitute. I've worked 15 years in a school around here and taught to 15 times 100, uh, 1,500 children, um, young people, about their career plans. And not one of them has said prostitute. Now, if they want to shock me, which of course they do sometimes, me being a middle-aged lady, they would say they'd like to be a porn star. That would be the boys, mainly. Uh, <laughs> but not one of them has said prostitute. And even being a prostitute today is considered a clandestine sort of occupation. It's something you wouldn't speak about. You wouldn't tell people what you did. And 3,000 years ago, I think we could say even more so. Mm -hmm. She would be despised. She would be the one who people shunned. We know also, as well as this, she ran a small B&B right in the city wall. So she is a successful businesswoman. And at this point in time, she has no man in her life, as far as we know. We have to assume that she turned to prostitution as a desperate measure to make ends meet. Now I'm going to go on to a bit of guesswork now because I'm really intrigued by Rahab. Guesswork is she likely had children. Perhaps she'd made an unsuitable marriage and her parents had thrown her out. Perhaps her partner had abused her and had abandoned her, leaving her with no income. Perhaps she had nobody to turn to, <coughs> and nobody would employ her because she was a fallen woman. And therefore, she turned to prostitution as the only way of making ends meet. Even if she had been abandoned by her husband, they would consider it to be her fault because she was a woman. Perhaps, again we're on guesswork, Perhaps she had been a prostitute and she'd managed to save some money and now she ran and be a bee. But because she had been a prostitute, she was still called Rahab the prostitute. It looks like her family did not live with her, they lived somewhere else. Perhaps they did have <coughs> very little to do with her because of her reputation. So that's just, just a bit of guesswork, but just thinking how, you know? And also, why did the spies go and stay at Rahab, Rahab's B&B? Why did they? Now the easy answer, we know now, it was part of God's plan. Both for now, to save the spies, and to save Jericho. I mean, for the fall of Jericho, and for the Israelites to move into Jericho. But there's more answers, aren't there? Possibly it was because of the location of her little guest house, right in the walls of the 
city of Jericho. Perhaps that was a good place for people to get in and out. Also, she could maybe look out the window and see what was going on, and the spies could use her knowledge of <coughs> entering and um, leaving Jericho. Also, it may have been a, question, a place where you could stay with few questions being asked. Um, perhaps it had a slightly doubtful reputation, so people tended not to ask who you were as you came in. Not one of these places where you have to hand in your passport at the front desk. <laughs> but Rahab knew who the spies were. When the authorities were looking for them, she hides them on her roof. She lies to the soldiers. She protects the two spies because she believes in their God. And she tells them the people are melting with fear because of you, you Israelites. Melting, that's quite a good word, isn't it? It's like your insides will turn to jelly and you can hardly do anything because you're just so frightened. Okay, so yes, this was God's plan. God used Rahab because he knew her heart and he knew her inward qualities. And God looks at the heart. People look at the outward appearance. Perhaps if you've been a prostitute, you will always be labeled a prostitute. But God sees who we really are. And we can refer back to other women that we, we know about. What about the woman who was taken in adultery and she was thrown out at Jesus, down at Jesus' feet and they said, shall we stone her? Jesus says to her, go and sin no more. He has pity on her and he shows mercy to her. And what about the woman at the well that we learned about very recently? And Jesus said, oh, I haven't filled in the number, is it you have had five husbands? Yeah. You have had five husbands already, and the man you are living with is not your husband. Mm -hmm. So again, a bit of a fallen woman. But God has time for fallen women and for fallen men. God, unlike society, does not write people off. Now, when Rahab is mentioned in the Bible, and she is mentioned in the New Testament. It's almost always Rahab the prostitute. And that is a reminder every time that God does not write people off. We should note that and not write ourselves off, whatever we have done. And let's look at how Rahab and her family are saved. We know it's through faith, but there is a visible sign, and that is the scarlet cord in the window. Now then, why scarlet? Scarlet's a very bright red, a sort of orangey red. I don't like that red red. That red over there. <coughs> very bright red, so it's very visible. So the Israelite army marching along, ready to take these walls as the walls come tumbling down can clearly see this is the place where Rahab and her family will be. It's very visible. But also, this occurred to me, and it may have occurred to you, it reminds me of the Passover. Remember we did the Passover a few weeks ago, and we talked about the blood on the doorpost yeah. and the lintels. And by the blood they were saved. Okay, this isn't real blood, but it's scarlet, so it's the colour of blood. So it reminds us that entry, that window, and we know it was an entry because they went down through the window. That entry had the sign of the blood over it. So the blood, was, they would be saved by the blood. Mm -hmm. So let's look at the character again of Rahab in more detail. Why does God choose Rahab? We know she was courageous. And now I'm going to refer back to that little refrain at the beginning of, of Joshua 1, at the end of Joshua 1. Be strong and very courageous. God likes people of courage. 
people who will step out and get out of their comfort zone. She takes a big risk. Obviously, there were some double agents, possibly, seeing that these spies had entered Rahab's um, B&B because they report back to the king and straight away messages come from the king, give us the two spies. <coughs> so she knew she, her life was in danger. By lying to the soldiers, she was lying to the king and therefore she possibly could die. If they found the spies, they would probably kill the spies, but they'd probably kill Rahab as well for being a traitor to her city. We know she was enterprising. We know she started her own little guest house. I'm sure that wasn't a common thing to do for a woman in those times. She was enterprising because she finds ways of helping the spies. She hides them on the roof. That's her own idea. She hides them under some flags. And she thinks about them hiding in the hills for three days. And also she tells the soldiers to go the other way. So she is enterprising. We know she is caring. She cares for the Israelites, the two spies. And she also asks for protection for her family. She's a woman of action. She actually does something. And more importantly, she's a woman of faith. She talks about your God. That say, for the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on the earth below. So she has profound faith in the God of the Israelites. And this is before anyone's told her anything, really. All she knows is the story of the parting of the Red Sea and heard stories of the Israelite army. But from that, she recognizes that your God is God in heaven above and on the earth below. So we could see Rahab as a saviour in this situation. I was going to say twice, but it's actually three times. She saves the spies. They would have lost their lives if the soldiers had found them in her house, and they were obviously going to barge in. And if they had barged in, she had them hidden on the roof. So she saves the spies. Her faith in God saves her family. And her faith in God helps the Israelites to gain the city. So she's a saviour. Now, ready for the joke. What happens to Rahab? She comes to a fishy end. Got it? She marries a very fishy character. And the name of that character is Salmon. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Uh, all my own work. Um, and Salmon <laughs> is the father of Boaz. And he's the chap who marries Ruth. So therefore she is marrying into the royal line. She is a descendant of King David. Ancestor. King David is an as a descendant of Rahab. And therefore, she is in the royal line. And therefore, <coughs> she is... What's that word again? Ancestor. That's it. An ancestor to Jesus. She is mentioned in the New Testament. She is mentioned in the genealogy. Matthew 1, verse 5. Salmon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. So even when we're introducing Jesus right at the beginning of Matthew chapter 1, she is mentioned, which is very significant. Jumping on to the end of the story, I'm sure you realise that um, what, what happens is exactly as she promised to the spies and the spies promised to her. And it says in Joshua 6, but Joshua spared Rahab the prostitute with her family and all who belonged to her because she hid the men Joshua had sent as spies to Jericho. And she lives among the Israelites to this day. So that's obviously when they were writing Joshua, whoever wrote Joshua, we don't quite know who it was, but she was part, became part of the Israelite family. 
So, back to my question, my title. How to be a good prostitute. Now, it's the same as how to be a good teacher, how to be a good lawyer, how to be a good mother or father or grandparent or neighbour, how to be a good person, how to be a good Christian. The answer is, turn to God. Turn to God and turn away from sin. Trust in God, who is able to do the impossible. And be active to promote the word of God. Whatever your situation, you can do something to be active to promote the word of God and make a difference. God wants us to be co-workers with him. He could do it all himself but he chooses to make us co-workers. So what happened to Rahab? From downtrodden, despised, rejected, prostitute, lowest of the low, she becomes a princess. She married Salmon. She married into the royal line. She became the ancestor of kings. King David, King Solomon, and King of Kings, Jesus himself. She has a place in history. And it says in Hebrews, By faith, the prostitute Rahab, because she welcomed the spies, was not killed with those who were disobedient. Each one of us has a destiny, and each one of us has a special role only we can fulfill to help bring in his kingdom. Amen. Amen.